Hello and welcome to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Roy Counts. On 1st February, the world got up to hear the news that there was a military coup in Burma. Uh, weeks after that, we started seeing some horrific pictures of protesters being beaten and people being shot dead. Up to now, about 250 people have died in the protest and over 3,000 people have been arrested. Now, to discuss what's happening, uh, because we only read the headlines, but what's happening beyond the headlines, I have with me in the studio a panel of three people. So, on my left, I have Tin Mama U. So, Tin Mama is the uh, founder of the Democracy for Myanmar organization and uh, the working group for New Zealand. Uh, uh, Tin Mama has also been an activist and uh, she actually came to uh, New Zealand as a refugee with her parents and in the course of this discussion, uh, Tin Mama will tell us a bit about her story. Uh, to Tin Mama's right, we have uh, Thai Tai. Thai Tai. Thai. Yes, I'm sorry about that, but Thai Tai, who uh, is the communications uh, person on this working group uh, with the Democracy for Myanmar. And interestingly, right uh, to my extreme left, I have uh, Tin Ao. And you know, actually, is an ex-military personnel uh, from uh, Myanmar, and he is going to share some of his stories with us. So uh, basically, this program is to find out what's happening in in Myanmar, and what are these uh, group of uh, very young activists? What are they doing in New Zealand uh, to help the government that was deposed? So, Tinmo, let me begin with you. Uh, we have been hearing in the news that uh, the military junta has. Uh, you know, overthrown uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who uh, has a huge international profile, Nobel Prize winner, fought for democracy, was in jail for 15 years, mm -hmm. and she was deposed. What was the reason uh, for that? Why did the military, uh, you know, uh, depose her? We are hearing that there was some electoral fraud. On Monday the 1st of Feb, while filming her morning routine, this instructor accidentally captured the beginnings of a military coup. You see those vehicles in the background? They're actually on their way to arrest political leaders and take control of the government. The military announced a one-year state of emergency and that power would be handed over to this guy, Military General Min Aung Laing. The military says that the country's elections held in last November were rigged and that there were signs of terrible fraud, even though they haven't been able to produce any credible evidence. Myanmar, or as it was known back then, Burma, spent 124 years under British rule. In the years after World War II, the country finally gained its independence as the Union of Burma. Unfortunately, there was unrest and fighting between the many different ethnic and cultural groups that make up the country. And in 1962, the military staged a coup, scrapped Burma's constitution, and created a military junta. What followed was a one-party state, headed by the BSPP. It wasn't until 1988 that the BSPP had its power truly challenged by a nationwide protest movement. Started by students, the movement spread to hundreds of thousands of protesters, and Aung San Suu Kyi emerged as a leading voice. Aung San Suu Kyi is the daughter of Aung San, known as the father of the nation and a key player in the push for independence from British rule. However, within a few months, the protests were crushed, thousands of people were killed, and the military once again seized power. Aung San Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest, where she remained for 15 years. During that time, though, she still did continue to push for change, with her political party, the National League for Democracy, eventually earning a Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. It wasn't until 2015 that Myanmar actually held its first free and open elections, and the NLD won in a landslide. The constitution actually blocked Aung San Suu Kyi from becoming president because she has kids who are citizens of another country, so she had to settle for the title of state councillor, but was still recognised by pretty much everyone as Myanmar's actual leader. For years now, Aung San Suu Kyi has been talking about removing the military from parliament and taking away their political power. Winning by such a huge margin in the election put her and the NLD closer to that goal than ever before. Not only that, the current military leader and the guy who is now in charge of the entire country has been pretty open about wanting to be president. Uh, Roy, I believe, um, you know, it's absolutely retaining power mm. of the military junta mm. and they just couldn't comprehend the idea of letting that go mm -hmm. after five decades of dictatorship mm. and complete rulership of the country. Mm. Uh, and therefore, 
now that our civilian government has been democratically elected, and the fact that National League for Democracy Party has won 82 percent over mm. its required seat, mm. uh, which completely overthrow any military um, uh, interest right. within the civilian political system. Right. And, and so they couldn't comprehend that idea and therefore they used an excuse of mm. a fraudulent mm. um, during the election campaign mm. and demanded for a re-election. Mm -hmm. The election commission themselves have said that uh, there was no malpractice, is that right? Correct. Mm. Yeah. And as um, the world have witnessed mm. um, over the last you know, five decades, mm. our people have gone through um, living below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. Our country has suffered enormously through mm. this dictatorship. Mm. And just with Within the, the last, uh, from 2015 up mm. until the 2020 election, mm. Mm. our young generation mm. have tasted a bit of freedom mm. and what it's like to be living under the democratic rulership right. and, and political system. Yeah. And therefore with that, and look, the world has moved on so beyond mm. technological-wise, economic-wise and education-wise, and our country, our generation is living in the past. Right. And there's no way we can break through that. Mm. Mm. So because of that, Generation Z, which is this is it. This yeah. generation said enough is enough and military is not welcome at all in the civilian government. I think, uh, let me add, I think they are that, you know, uh, the, all the military personnel, they are quite used to being in the military right. and they quite enjoy the power. Mm, yeah. And so they would like to continue that power. Yeah. So that's why they are uh, listening to that order. Right. They are following that order. Right, okay. Yeah. So so basically it's all, it's just to remain in that. And I think uh, from what I have read in the international press, uh, over the last five years, the military, or rather uh, elements within the military have accumulated a lot of wealth from right. uh, international yeah. business. And because yeah. the, the, for 50 years, uh, Myanmar was uh, under sanctions. In fact, one of the reasons why the military allowed uh, you know, elections was that sanctions were crippling. And as you all were telling me before the show that uh, most of you grew up in a country where you didn't have a lot of uh, what people would consider uh, you know, basic necessities because of the sanctions from international uh, you know, uh, pressure from the international governments. Now, I want to ask you uh, about 300 uh, people who were of part of the government which was deposed uh, went into hiding and they have formed a sort of an underground resistance government yeah, uh, where they are trying to drum up international support and I think you uh, people are part of that uh, movement. It is called that uh, C, uh, CRPH. Yes, right. correct. So CRPH yep. is basically a sort of a government in exile. Uh, you know, uh, sort of. It has not yet been formalized. So tell us about what is CRPH and what are you guys doing here in, 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 you know, in, in uh, New Zealand? Yeah. So CRPH is formed uh, on the 5th of February. Mm. So um, by, the, by, the by the elected, civilian elected uh, member of parliament. Who had to go underground. Yeah, okay. so they went underground. They yeah. are not uh, outside of, not necessarily outside of the country. Mm -hmm. So they are in hiding. Mm -hmm. So on the 1st of February, mm -hmm. they were to convene. Mm -hmm. But because of the military coup happened on mm -hmm. the 1st of February, mm -hmm. and they arrested uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the president. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the, most of the member of parliaments who were uh, uh, elected um, by, this, uh, by the civilian. Mm. So they went into hiding and they formed on the first, uh, 5th of February and called CRPH. Mm -hmm. and, and they what they do is that they convened online, mm. through online, because they all were in different places and they took on an oath. And so this is actually um, our civilian put it that way, civilian government. Yeah. And so this is at the moment. So they are in uh, working uh, really closely with also international communities as well. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So according, uh, according, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I just would like to add that, you know, the reason we are wanting to make this such a symbolic uh, move is that internationally and politically, if we look at it, whenever there's a coup, mm. there is not a backup plan. Mm -hmm. You see, people look at, oh, that's a coup. Mm. So who's the next leader? Mm. What's going to happen? But with us, mm. this new movement mm. is saying, Listen, that's a coup, but mm. we have the people's elected government mm -hmm. that are representative of the members of the parliament, mm -hmm. which people 
voted democratically That's and it. therefore we're telling the world that we have a backup plan and that is the plan of the people mm. and that is we have our own government who is ready to take over and lead this country right. remove the military regime mm. and we shall be in operation mm. and that is the message we want to give to the world mm. Roy yeah, that's it right so yeah. one of the uh, you know uh, the pivotal moment uh, moment when uh, the world's consciousness was aroused was when that 19-year-old girl who was protesting was suddenly shot dead. She was mm -hmm. just standing and next thing she's got a bullet in her head and she's fallen down and the people are you know, sort of trying to revive her and she's dead. And that was because of the sniper. And I think that was a pivotal mom you know, moment when uh, people started talking about the coup and started discussing it. That's right, yeah. yeah. So and that is because of the pictures that we saw, which was not possible in 1989 no. and in 19, 2007. Yeah, it's behind the wall at that time. Mm -hmm. And now, like, the wall could see that. Mm -hmm. And all the footages of their arrests, their tortures, mm -hmm. and, you know, they beat people up in the street. And also, like, apparently, they yeah. even shot. So... Um, and they're they, targeting doctors and, uh, uh, and uh, ambulance personnel. Yes. They, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing that, aren't they? Yes, okay. they even did the medics. Yeah, med okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess if my if if my if I may add, mm. um, is that you know controlling um, the internet mm. um, system mm. is completely shutting down people's movement mm -hmm. of human mobility. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's the way which is uh, quite effective. Is that during the whole of night time, people mm. are not in operation mm. and they couldn't communicate. Mm -hmm. So which means that what's happening in one region mm -hmm. couldn't communicate through. Yeah. Unfortunately, hey, too late because mm. Generation Z is outsmarting the regime. Right. So we're telling the regime. Um, you bet. You know you are you you are messing with the wrong generation. Yeah. It's the slogan mm. because in the past. Um, when they control, people don't even know what's happening between each region, region you see. Mm -hmm. So they could retain that power mm -hmm. through violence. Mm -hmm. But now the more violent they get, mm -hmm. the more people are speaking out about it. Yeah. And, and also that also cripples our international communication as well. Right. At the moment, none of us are able to send money. Okay. You know, there is no, because of all these international links, the mm. military shut down, mm -hmm. internet cut down, mm. really uh, cripple people, mm -hmm. um, international businesses all down, mm. banking systems down, but they had to keep their business internet alive yeah. because there is a business as usual mm. with this regime mm -hmm. and we want to target that now. Right. Yeah. Tell us uh, something, um, you know, uh, I have never lived under a uh, military regime, uh, having, you know, being from India. We have always had elected government, you know, we never lived through, you know, that kind of, but some other nations around India have had the experience of military dictatorships. Mm -hmm. What was it like uh, living under a military dictatorship? For example, Tinamam, I'd like to ask you, because you came here as a refugee. Your parents were political refugees. Yeah. So you all fled from, you know, Myanmar, you all yeah. came here as political refugees. So. As an activist, you are an activist, you, uh, you know, have been quite vocal, you are quite well known in the community. In fact, you have worked with uh, people like uh, Michael Wood and uh, Priyanka Radhakrishnan during the election. So even politically, you are well connected. So I think it was, you know, that entire political upbringing which you had, which has sort of made you aware of these things. Tell us about what was the, you know, how did your parents, uh, f uh, you know, live under a... Uh, under a dictatorship. A dictatorship, yeah. yeah. Uh, I get there's two memories that I have during my childhood. Mm. Is that I have lost my childhood completely mm. growing up. Mm. You know, because we were in Thailand mm. and the Thai authority at the time wouldn't allow, allow any children mm. to gain a formal education. Mm. So I was homeschooled and just looking out for students in their uniform. Mm. So I thought, how come I'm a child just like them but have no rights? to have my own education and also I haven't got my own family around me and I haven't got any friends. So as a child I was very isolated. Second incident in my life is before we come to New Zealand, Thai authority were planning to deport all their refugees back in Burma and therefore the United Nations say, okay, you know, we have to get the refugees inside the refugee camp so that immigration people can come and governments can take quota refugees. First time in my life going inside a refugee camp, completely surrounded by peoples of all backgrounds, exposed to such violence and crime as well, and facing such control type system with soldiers with their guns, um, you know, security, medical check, people queuing up for food. You know, I really had that personal experience. And I thought to myself, no one, you know, I get emotional because yeah. no one allowed to feel that way, yeah. right? So 
So you come to New Zealand as a former refugee. You, you are the second class citizen. And you, had, you lost all that opportunity growing up. Um, and now you have to fight life again. You have to rebuild your life, you know. And, and I feel like listening to our son Suji, use your liberty to promote ours. Use whatever opportunities you have. Because there are millions of people back home yeah. who has not given that opportunity in life. Yeah. And that's why I get very um, passionate about it. Because we, while we enjoy this freedom of you know, democracy and liberty and in a beautiful country. Sure, we can all just move on with our lives. Mm. But as a civil society, our actions, our voice, our advocacy could save lives yeah. and bring justice and humanity to other part of the world who hasn't had that opportunity. Right. And, and that's really what drives me every sing single day of my life. I'm not advocating just for Myanmar. Mm -hmm. I have been a tax contributor in New Zealand since the age of 16. I have been a volunteer in all of different channels in New Zealand. I've worked for a lot of NGOs volunteering my time as well. So I'm a giver. And I believe that together, through a kind heart, and compassion, we can bring humanity. And me serving as a New Zealander, as a Kiwi, to our Aotearoa families, but I also have my heart and compassion for my ancestors' land. And now I'm asking everybody to join me with that. Very inspirational. In fact, when you said that thing about uh, being a you know, young girl watching others in Thailand wearing a school uniform and you yeah. were wondering why you didn't, that brought a small tear to my eye. I yeah, really felt I felt mm. emotional when I heard that because it is these kind of small stories which actually shape, yeah. you know. I, I mean, uh, some New Zealanders, uh, you know, probably would think, oh, there's something happening in Myanmar far away from us. You know, how are we involved? We have we all have a, you know, happy life here. But uh, the kind of stories that you say actually touches the chord. You know, we, we think of the 55. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, New Zealanders who may not know. Uh, Burma has a population of uh, 52 million, I think, which is almost 54, 54 million, yeah. which is uh, 10 times the population of uh, New Zealand. And uh, for those who have been there, because you know India has got a lot of connections uh, with Myanmar, a very beautiful country, you know yeah. the mountains and the plains, and you know the uh, it's a, it's as beautiful I would say as uh, New Zealand is. So it's a country, a very blessed country, but unfortunately because of political upheavals, the country has not been able to reach the... Uh, Tourism industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, to reach the heights that they should economically yeah. because of yeah. the uh, sanctions. Yeah, uh, and I think, you know, since growing up in New Zealand, now I have my postgraduate for qualification, mm. politics, public policy, mm. and after missing out all of that, mm. and yet I have this opportunity to be an educated woman right. and earn that respect. Mm. And while that, I've been a government, um, you know, public servants in New Zealand. Mm. I've held a lot of high position mm. in New Zealand. Mm. And I thought, my goodness, mm. if I could grab an opportunity, if there is one, at the age of 14 onward, mm. I could make a huge difference. Mm. But in Myanmar, people have no opportunities. Yeah. It's survivor of the fittest, which means a lot of anarchy, chaos, and crime. Mm. And that is not the future I want to see for mm. my people. Yeah. And uh, to now uh, you, you are doing a PhD, so yes. so you know in public policy, is it? Uh, public, uh, sorry, population health. Po population health. Yes. Okay. So uh, highly educated people, you know, very committed to the cause. Uh, what are you? What is the CRPH uh, doing in New Zealand? What, what are sort of uh, what doors are you knocking at? Because uh, Tinmama, you you know know quite a few politicians personally. What has been your experience? Is the international community coming together? Is it, uh, you know, are you approaching the United Nations? What's happening? Well, um, I, I think we are very grateful that we have such great government mm -hmm. um, who believe in human rights mm -hmm. and advocating for mm -hmm. humanity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have made a history of being the first voice mm -hmm. um, condemning the military regime and also cutting diplomatic ties. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, now, we also have some you know, local MP support, okay. um, talking to us behind the scene, mm -hmm. advising us and encouraging us how best to link the diplomatic channels mm -hmm. in terms of advocating the uh, re restoration of democracy mm -hmm. in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. So what we want our government now is that our, you know, each country is uh, interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. We are interdependent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, through condemnation and isolations of military regime, 
we show you know um, denounce the business as usual mm. so there is no business as usual for them mm. so we would like our government to continue that positions of you know isolating them diplomatically mm. and also encourage their um, other channels of alliance mm. to do the same mm. um, in terms of our community look Aotearoa is such a beautiful country with freedom of speech we were allowed to express ourselves in Aotearoa mm. um, in Aotea Square in mm. Auckland mm. Uh, and then we managed to get our Kiwis to get involved That's and right. Roy look you have invited us to be yeah. here this is a great powerful yeah. platform yeah and so I think in New Zealand we are doing a lot in terms of raising awareness yeah. we are getting um, support from our public yeah. we are also now getting support from our government to see to find ways of how to move forward diplomatically as well as under humanitarian mission yeah. how can we best support people who are the victims on the ground level right of course we are still exploring those channels yeah and, and I think that's what uh, we want to do we want to give a platform you know to uh, all voices so that people know they can make up their own minds you know I Personally, I'm not advocating for one or the other, you know, yeah. but when we but we need to have the conversations We need to have that talk right. and when we have the conversation then people can make up their minds as to who is right Who is wrong whom they should support whom they shouldn't yes. so our job, you know as journalists is to let people know the facts Because often we get facts only from one side and we don't yeah. know the the other side I also want to share my uh, personal feeling about living in uh, military dictatorship. Yeah yeah, the most significant uh, feeling um, when we were living in military dictatorship is like fear. Mm. Um, you can be arrested mm. and detained mm. at any time without reason. Mm. Um, and, then, um, and then you can do anything mm. because they are about the law. Yeah. And then um, I also want to add one more comment about mm. uh, living in uh, military dictatorship mm. is like when when you, we lost all like bas even basic human rights thing, mm. like mm. you know for every freedom of um, freedom of religion and belief mm. so for example like if we want to say something about politic mm. we can say we can say mm. if we are talking about politic mm. in a tea shop mm. you, you 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 are not pretty sure that um, you will be you can go back to your home. Uh, because there may be spies who, yes. are, who, are, so, over, who are listening to what you're saying in yes, a T-shirt. Right. Okay. So there's a saying in Myanmar that mm. every wall has ears. Mm -hmm. So that means we, we are closing our uh, mouth. Uh, we're just listening. You, you're, you're afraid. You, you're, you know, there's a, afraid, there's a kind of sort of um, fear mm. in your mind mm. all the time. Mm. That there's... That, um, that, is, that is my most significant feeling about living in military dictatorship. Tell me something. Uh, the military says uh, that they are going to uh, keep power for one year while mm. they restore democracy. Okay? Uh, we know that most military regimes say that. Last time this happened, they kept power for 50 years. Yes. Do you envisage a situation where uh, you know, Myanmar could go down the North Korea path and become a pariah state? Is that a possibility? Most definitely. Yeah. 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 Yes. By looking at current situation, you can see that uh, where it is leading to. And like um, what you mentioned uh, previously, this is true that they, like, um, they take all the organs out when mm -hmm. they return the body, mm -hmm. dead bodies mm -hmm. to the um, family. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't even return. Okay. And one... Um, one boy, his mom only received the brain in the back, oh plastic God. bag. So <sighs> it's, it's a really brutal way of torturing. And so before they, they got killed, one, you know, now, you know, on the scene, you see that, you know, three, nearly 300 people died, etc. And people got arrested. And when people got arrested, no one really knows what happened behind the wall mm. and how they tortured. Mm. And only, uh, only way the families found out is how they returned the dead bodies. Mm. And the, the, the dead bodies really tells how they have been notoriously tortured. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, your organization, the Democracy for Myanmar, uh, you are doing a lot of uh, uh, meetings with uh, the New Zealand press, aren't you? You, you are so. Of course, uh, you, you came on the show because, Tidmama, I know you personally from we go back many years, yeah. and I personally wanted to 
share with our viewers what's happening in Myanmar because we read the papers, we read, uh, you know, Washington Post or BBC or New Zealand Herald and we get our news from there. But it is important to actually get news from ground zero and which is why I thought that, you know, because I knew you, we, we could do that. But what has been the reception uh, from the New Zealand media on this? Have they been, you know, quite uh, neutral or have they been supportive? No, I, I believe it has been very supportive, Roy, mm -hmm. you know, because we are all voicing under humanity mm -hmm. and that's all we are wanting. And the working group um, consists of all the regional representatives across New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So it is not just a small working group doing it in Auckland. Mm -hmm. uh, we are actually carrying the voices of all our ethnic communities mm -hmm. from Myanmar mm -hmm. who are New Zealand citizens. Mm -hmm. So as New Zealand citizens who are civil society, we are making a stand for what is right. And what we want to say is injustice for one is injustice for all. Mm -hmm. So whatever happening in the neighbor country, it affects us. Yeah. You know, if we're going to keep on taking quota refugees, which spend a lot of money as the national funding, mm -hmm. if there is no, no more refugees from Myanmar, mm -hmm. that's one less problem for New Zealand. Right. That's so very well put, actually. Yeah. That's because right. By helping, uh, you know, people there, we are actually stopping the refugees from coming to other countries, whether it's New Zealand, Australia, or whichever country. Correct. Yeah. We don't want point. to, yeah. um, you know, keep on uh, uh, requesting help for damage control Mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, we prefer that prevention is better than cure method. Right. So you go and look at the root causes mm -hmm. and you do at all things that you can at mm -hmm. all diplomatic channels. If you can make a change to the root causes, mm -hmm. then it's a great long-term investment approach right. for the world leaders. Absolutely. Very well put. And uh, so are you doing anything uh, with the politicians? Uh, with the, yes. you know, with the, uh, so you're lobbying with them too. Yes, well, there are things happening in the background. Very good, okay. And then I'd just like to say, Roy, um, journalism is one of our greatest supporters mm -hmm. because without this platform, mm -hmm. we are not able to voice. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, you know, for having us on your show because you have opened up the platform, the voices of those 54 million yeah. in Myanmar Thank you so much. and all the thousands of Myanmar ethnic communities yeah. in New Zealand. And you haven't just opened up a door for this ethnic group and this population. This is a social justice movement yeah. where the platform is available for any other society who are suffering under injustice system. Right. So I just would like to, on behalf of all of us, wholeheartedly Thank you, and, and wish welcome. this channel a great success, and it is a much-needed channel for all our ethnic communities to be yeah, united. Yeah, yeah and that, that, that's been our endeavor. We try to give voice to the unheard. So, you know, our tagline is, you know, the voice of the unheard. Because the mainstream media, either they think it is a too small uh, incident or they think yeah. it's too remote. That's but right. uh, as ethnic uh, communities, you know, we understand each other and that's understand right. the issues. And it is for us to you know, discuss it and let the world know uh, what's happening. You know, uh, they can make up their own minds. You know, the, of course, there will be pressure. People will try to stop you and, and they will, there, will, there will always be, you know, external pressure to silence voices. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the minute you, you know, zip, you know, zip, zip your mouth, uh, you know, that's when I think you have lost it. Yeah, so you right. need to let people know what's happening. Uh, let people make up their minds, you know. Uh, and well, you know, all of us ethnic people have lived under some sort of an oppressive and, yeah. uh, and you know, suppressive system yeah. and regimes. That's right. And so we have lived with silence all our life. Mm -hmm. Even as New Zealanders, mm -hmm. we are still being the passive society mm -hmm. and not participating. Mm -hmm. I am making a movement here and requesting mm -hmm. all our ethnic communities, hey, we are the civil society, we are New Zealanders, we have the right to vote, mm -hmm. which I mean, as citizens of a liberated and democratic country, we actually have the power to make a difference. That difference is mean lobbying to our government and requesting our government to make a couple of crucial decisions mm. that affect national economy mm. and foreign policy. Right. So ethnic community have the power to communicate with their local MPs, make a stand. You haven't had that opportunity back home, mm. but here you have the right to exercise and practice democracy and human rights in real life basis. Right. So thank you so much, uh, all the three of you, Tin Mama, Tai Tai and uh, Tinao. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the studio and sharing your views with us and uh, letting the world know about uh, what's happening uh, in Myanmar. I, ho I wish you all the best in your endeavors and I you. hope that uh, you, know, you make a success of your movement. Thank you so much. Thank you thank very you, much. And thank Please you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, viewers, for uh, joining in. And uh, 
uh, seeing this show. I hope you have learned a bit about uh, what's happening back in Myanmar. So uh, I'll see you again uh, next Friday, uh, 7 p.m. with another show.